Welcome to the Data Leadership Lessons Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony J. Algman. Data is everywhere in our businesses, and it takes leadership to make the most of it. We bring you the people, stories, and lessons to help you become a data leader. Today, I'm joined by John Ladley. John is an experienced practitioner who helps organizations define and transition to new business and data capabilities. His books are considered the primary source for organizations to enable alignment of business and data strategy, organizational change, and practical application of data technology to business problems. John focuses on adding data to the society's and organization's mentality. Our post-industrial era must address land, labor, capital, and data. John, welcome to the show. Thank you. Wow, that's profound. Some smart guy must have said all that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, John, you are a, and I hope you don't mind me calling you this, an absolute legend in the data governance and data management communities. I Thank you. I, I wish my bank account reflected that, but I appreciate that to, to no end. Thank you very, so, very much. You know, John, you have um, you know, a, a long career, and maybe why don't we just start and, and give sure. uh, our audience just a little bit of a highlight of how you came to be known at, at such a um, you know, profound level as a, as a mm. you know, thought leader in the data management space, and, and how did you get into this, and, and kind of what are yeah. you Yeah, well, um, the short version I give, which is you know me well, Anthony, I hardly ever do a short version, but... <laughs> Um, I, uh, um, was in the wrong doorway at the right time. Uh, and that's absolutely true in the late 1980s after diving into the first, the first leg of the stool, which is being disciplined about things, right. Kind of an engineering mindset. Right. And that was software engineering. And I was involved with the case tools and the James Martin things and, 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 and all of, all of that, uh, uh, stuff and stood up a, 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 a software engineering program at Washington University here in St. Louis, and uh, which is, by the way, that's where I live, St. Louis, not San Francisco or New York, anyway. Um, so anyway, um, uh, so I had that, but um, I went to work for a company and became their chief information officer. Uh, but that company did something really cool that no other company was going to do for another 30 years, and that was monetize data and sell it to people. Mm. And they were collecting data and packaging it and sending it, and some of it was like top secret stuff, and some of it was commercial, and it was really, really neat. And I learned organically about data quality, data movement, um, and all the problems that go with data being a product, data being an asset that the organization depends on to survive. And uh, that company um, uh, had some issues. Uh, I, we all basically, they went out of business, um, uh, not due to anything they did. Uh, um, what we, well, back then, we, what we said was peace broke out because we had some defense contracts. Um, <laughs> And uh, um, I ended up getting pulled into consulting. And I ended up, because I could say things in data, I ended up doing data things. Um, the next bellwether moment was a client came down the hall, sat me down with my partner, because I was in the big five, and, and they're glaring at me. And they said, you're in a lot of trouble. You're in a lot of trouble. Mm. I go, OK. Why did I do? I just show up and work, right? Because I was a you know entry level consultant. Um, oh, I built something that they declared was a data warehouse, and I said, "Wow, great!" I'd never heard of it. <laughs> so um, I just solved the problem. Um, they were all upset, but they decided because it was working, it wasn't such a bad idea. But maybe I wasn't a smart guy, so they called in this guy named Bill Inman. I had never heard of him mm. anyway. Bill came in and we met each other and the, and uh, the, so that's two really good things that happened to me. Three good things that happened to me. Fourth bad thing was I turned down the job offer from Bill. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, then I just went on to do data. After that, it was data warehouse. I'm not going to go in my whole resume or anything right. like that. 
Uh, but what was nagging at me the whole time was why can't we get it to stick? This is something really profound. This is something that really, really works. This is something, and I said land, labor, capital, and data 30 years ago. I said it at a TDWI conference, and everyone looked at me like I had a second head popping out of my shoulder. And they were like, oh, that's crazy. It's just data. I said, no, if, if it's this important, it's got to have, and, and then, then, you know, with a bunch of folks over the last 20, 30 years, like you, like uh, Len Silverstein, Peter Rakin, Tom Rakin, blah, 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 blah. You know, we're finally thinking about this. Um, and what I do now is I actually just intellectually pursue this. You have data as an asset. It's not just data as an asset like we can count. It's something that's changing society. It's something that's anthropologically affecting humankind. And, and we're, we're slackers. We're not getting it. We're not getting it. But, I, you know, we're sneaking up on it like people do. All right. Yeah. Has, has data actually arrived yet? Like, are we are we still fighting that battle of awareness of, of the importance of data? Or is that become has that become known and agreed and we just haven't been able to figure that out and what to do about it? I, I keep I'm using this analogy more and more. Um, it's like being um, out of shape. You you look in the mirror and you go, oh, man, I got to do better. You know, uh, and and you know about being fit. Um, you know how good you feel when you're fit, um, but you don't wanna do the work to get there. And CEOs love the idea of monetizing their data. They love the idea of AI or machine learning. They love all the benefits, but folks, it's diet and exercise to get there. There's no pills, there's no tools, there's no magic. It's change. You got to, you know, just like I uh, uh, had a really good friend that was overweight and he had that surgery and then he got really skinny and then he just kept eating and now it looks like he never had the surgery. So, you know, that kind of that kind of stuff. Um, it's like any other endeavor where you go, boy, that's a great idea, but I don't have the time or the effort to get into it. And that's human nature. We're all like that. So we've. We've accomplished the first step. We have awareness. We have understanding. Um, what we don't have is comprehension that there is some hard work to be done. All right. Now, I'll use the phrase Tom Redmond uses. There's points of lights everywhere. Lots of people have done data things where they build a great model and they've done cool thing for their business, right? They've done a data quality program and fixed some data and saved some money. They put in a data warehouse or a data lake or a master data management or and, you know, any one of the alphabets, <laughs> any one of the acronyms we work with, right? right, right. Um, they, they, they've done it, but, but these are all point solutions. Right. But we, and, and, and so we know the value, we know it works, but everyone's going, wow, you know, where's that big, where's that big lift? All the boats are not rising in the tide evenly yeah. across, across enterprises. And why is that? Why do we still... I mean, I had a conversation with a client this morning that said, well, our data is really bad. We got to do something about it. And, and yeah, we're going to do this data governance program. And I, okay, great. But what about your data strategy? Well, no, we'll get to data strategy later. We're going to do governance now. <laughs> no, no. So you didn't listen. You didn't, you didn't pay attention. Okay. Um, that's where that's where we are with points of light but then to make it that deep enterprise thing it's we're not there yet and and there's precedent um two good examples in the late 50s early 60s organizations decided they need to have a new area it was very controversial because it was new overhead uh it was extra people it seemed to be a burden at the time to the operational areas and the middle management and they didn't like it at all mm -hmm. um and they fought it tooth and nail human resources mm -hmm. think about it in the late in until the 60s companies did not have hr you your boss hired you your boss fired you <laughs> okay and when they did, they said, no, no, hey, look, I've been I, doing my own people for years. I don't need any central control over that. I don't need anything like that. And then the next time it happened was with the CIO. 
because I was in IT when this when I was reading the front page of Computer World magazine. Um, is that even around anymore? And anyway, <laughs> uh, and uh, I mean, we'd all wait for it. Ooh, you know, when it was dropped off uh, in the department mailbox. Um, and it was CIO, do organizations need a chief information officer, right. you know, and, and our arc, the little company I was with said, no, nah, we have a director of data processing. He does just fine. We don't need a CIO. Yeah. Um, and uh, a few years later, uh, our cost of production got so high that uh, we had to quit making our product and it was outsourced overseas and we let go of 25,000 people mm. in that company. And a lot of it was because the IT systems could not keep up. Yeah. So did we need a CIO? Yeah, probably. I don't, you know. So uh, there's bottom line with my long, windy explanation of how I got here. Um, and this is why I wrote my books. Uh, just kind of a blind rage. Um, <laughs> we're, we're on the cusp. We are on the cusp of doing this stuff right. But we just haven't acknowledged that there are some changes. You can do low profile things, you can do non-invasive things, you can make progress, but society as a whole, for all the boats to lift in the tide, which means across all enterprises and all sectors, government, state, private, NGO, for-profit, not-for-profit, for us to really start use data and get connected without sacrificing our personal rights and privacy, right? Mm -hmm. We gotta, we've got to make some structural changes. So, I, I mean, my, my career has been working my way towards that realization and then trying to do something about it. That's right. it. Right. So you, you've touched on a couple of things and, and you know, that, that recognition in organizations that there's a problem is, is getting there. I think we can agree. Um, yes. But there's always this uh, reliance, this natural tendency, and we see it in a bunch of different contexts, but this tendency to, to want to find that tool or in the data context, a lot of times we find these buzzwords like a while back, it used to be big data, this and big data that now you hear a little bit less about big data, but uh, like we talked about in our prep, the, the notion of like data literacy or being data driven, we hear about this constantly, but it becomes so ubiquitous that it doesn't mean anything. And yeah. People don't even understand what they're talking about. So what, what have you identified? Like, how do we get past this buzzword mentality and actually get something that, that will make a difference in the end? Well, I mean, you know, we're, we're like, we're like, we're, we're like enthusiastic teenagers. Um, uh, um, uh, I have a picture of um, Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland on one of my presentations. You may have seen it. And, and they're doing one of these, uh, um, uh, they did four movies back in the late 40s, 50s. And just as a sidebar, when I was a kid, I was in a lot for various reasons. So I watched a lot of old TV. All right. Mm -hmm. So so they had a series of these movies where they would say, let's do a show. Woo and it's all rosy and ideal and da, 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 da. And somehow, you know, two broke kids from the middle of nowhere, you know, four days later, uh, they have a Broadway producer bringing the entire New York production to, you know, left elbow Kansas and, and they do a big show and, you know, it's, you know, it's unrealistic. We're, we're at that. Let's do a show thing. That's where organizations go. Here's the buzzword. You get a vague sense of what's really, really cool. We can do it. And then, um, then you go, then they start to see that there's some work to be done and there's actually some discomfort there to get to the show because you don't ever put on a Broadway show in four days. It's in production and development for years, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and it changes a lot and you learn a lot and you fix a lot. And sometimes you throw out what you've already done and start all over again, right? And, and, and we, don't, we don't want that. We don't like that. We're in this instant gratification, quarterly reporting mentality from corporations and this you know, you, uh, Anthony, you've been in the projects where you start the project. There's lots of great hoo-ha. Yay, let's go. About a month or two in, you're right on schedule now, right? Oh, yeah. You're right on schedule. But then the boss says, hey, you know, you know, you guys are spending a lot of money. Um, can I? Can you give me something here? And then you hear what I call now call the dreaded phrase, low-hanging fruit. Oh, yes. All right. 
I hear longing. See, I'm now, I'm lucky. I've been around a long time. I'm old. I can get away with being crabby, right? <laughs> and when I hear low hanging fruit, I go, I had a client say, I said, we have a problem. What's that? I said, by using that phrase means you've given up. Mm. You've given up. So uh, yes, do, do, we do want this. Uh, uh, they do realize this. Um, no one's sitting still long enough to, to get the education. Um, part of that is what I call the laptop mentality. You and I are sitting in front of a laptop now. I bet you have Excel on it, right? Yep, of course. I bet you you do some databases for your business, right? Occasionally, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, receivables or whatever, or you're, you're, or you're doing your work and you, you download some data and you look at it. And, you know, we got business analysts doing this all the time. And they go, what's so hard, so hard about this data stuff? <laughs> right. Then that's where, that's where everyone's got, and yet that's our other enemy is the laptop mentality or what I call the row and column mentality too. Mm -hmm. That's also a big, a big obstacle. But again, you can be successful with that. That's great. But it's all these little dots and we're not connecting the dots. It's when you want to raise all the boats in the tide across your enterprise, that ain't going to work. Not going to work. Yeah. I think a part of it comes back to that people like defined beginnings and ends and they find that a the notion of doing data governance or just data in general with the, the nature of it being like HR, where it's, it's not going to come to an end. Like it's going to continue that yeah. aversion to that kind of commitment is a very common trait in organizations is that they feel like because so many of previous efforts have ended badly, why am I going to chase this thing that I know I need, but is it, it feels too hard or, or, or something. It, 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 well, uh, CEOs will say, you know, um, I know we got to do something about this data. I've got to quit kicking the can down the road. Um, and then I say, are, you know, what is this? You want to be data driven. All right. You, you mentioned literacy and data driven. Here's the way I, I talk about those terms now. To be data driven, you must be data literate. To me, I put one must happen before the other. A lot of people use them as synonymous. And I, I don't, my own personal semantic is I don't do that, right. okay? If an organization wants to truly be data-driven, which means you know all boats have risen in the tide, you're managing your data assets uh, consistently across all aspects, you've got uh, governance in place, you've got data management, you've got a data strategy that reflects your business strategy, all those things I talk about all the time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's data driven. Well, and you know, you might be reacting to a model or some machine learning or an AI algorithm, right? Something like that. Um, uh, um, then before that, you're literate. You understand the ramifications of what that means. It means you're going to take care of data quality. It's going to be important. Mm -hmm. It means you're going to train uh, your leadership in understanding the vagaries of data. All right, there's some philosophies, there's some abstractions that, I, I mean, year, uh, years ago, we were apologetic that we did a data model okay, and it was an abstraction. I mean, it's a great tool. Um, our mistake was was backing off and saying, well, you know, yes, abstractions, you were really sorry. Data is an abstraction, right? isn't it? But then again, so's interest. Do you pay interest on your house loan? Right, yeah. You pay interest on your car loan. You know, there was a time in history in the 17th century where when someone said, yeah, well, I'll help you get that boat across the sea. I'll finance the boat. I'll take the risk of the boat there. You know, go ahead there, Commander Drake. We're going to, you know, have a great time and bring back some good stuff. And I'll, you know, but when you come back, you pay me back plus a couple of extra bucks. Mm -hmm. And that's called interest. And everyone said, interest? You mean I pay you more than you gave me? Oh, my head, boom, my head explodes. But that was an abstraction. By gosh, we educated society on that. Who who doesn't understand it now, right? Mm -hmm. it, this it, we're we're in one of those. Again, I keep going back to this is an anthropological issue. When, when we talk about stuff at this high level, non-execution or what I call a society or an anthropological level, there's some big mind shifts that we need to make to be truly, truly broad spectrum, data driven, data literate. It, it, it's a long time. It's a road. There's no switch. There's no magic bullet to it. Um, but you know, when the CEO says, I want to be data driven, when I talk to a CEO, you say, okay, let's sit down and let's talk about what that you give me your vision. Don't use those words, but what does it look like to you? 
And what I usually find out is they just want to be better with their data. They want to, they want their data strategy to support their business strategy, but they don't even have a data strategy. Right. And that's normally what we, that's normally what it ends up being. And they, and they're happy. They're, they think they're, they are more data driven than they were, but they're not some academically perfect state of data driven either. Mm. You know, that's a, did I answer that or are we just having too good a time talking? Here? <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, I want to think about, so we're, we're recording this in the kind of throes of the COVID-19 pandemic. Oh, yeah. And and a lot of folks are, are working remote. And even as we move back towards the offices, there's going to be you know a significant amount of remote work happening for some time to come, it seems. Uh, yeah. what, what do you think? the implications of that are in this data space and, and the, the importance of, of data literacy um, or, or being data driven to organizations, is it getting more so or less, or are they becoming more aware? What do you think, what, what monkey wrenches is this pandemic throwing in that sphere of things? Well, there, there's two, there's two big monkey wrenches. One, um, Tom Redman and I, and a few other folks chipped in, wrote an article, it's on the Dataversity website um, about how data management has failed and the age of COVID has proven this. Mm -hmm. Okay, we haven't, we've talked about it. It's a great concept. We have all these points of lights, but again, none of all the boats haven't risen in the tide and we have failed. And, be, and the, the key example is the fact that someone can't, A, at the local level, they can't count the number of damn respirators in the hospital. They truly don't know. Mm -hmm. The number of beds people are in, I've got several healthcare clients and they, they, they're guessing sometimes or at the national international level is what's really making people sick. Where's the data? How many are sick? You know? And then it was like, well, Kansas reports it this way and Missouri reports it this way and New York reports it that way. And, and then everyone goes to John Hopkins and they're just taking all the data and they're just taking however anyone reports it, but there's no consistent. We, this is total evidence that we failed as a society at understanding data and data management. So that's the first part. That's that whole, that's one thing that COVID has really pointed out. This data stuff, folks, is anthropologically, societally important. It's not the first time this is gonna happen. There'll be other things that we need to trace ethically and maintain privacy, and we gotta figure that out. But this is only the first of many, many examples, the more data penetrates our everyday life. The second thing is you, where you started, which was this remote thing. We don't go into the office. We don't have face-to-face. -face. Well, now we're depending on that data even more. So the scenario I like to use is I have a question and I know my buddy Anthony's down the hall and he's been my go-to guy for the reports, right? Mm -hmm. So I go down the hall and I say, hey, let's let's look at some data together and we, we do something collaboratively. Um, uh, what's different now in, you know, doing that on Zoom means uh, you might share, I'm going to be watching every keystroke you're making and I'm going to be going, well, wait a second, where are you getting that data from? Right. Anthony, you're my go-to data guy. Why are you pulling data from that, that old database? And you go, well, that's the one that always gets me the most data. And I go, Oh my gosh, the last 10 years we've been working together, we've been just pumping out really wrong stuff because no one <laughs> likes that database, right? Right. These are not uncommon examples. Okay. So I, I do think we're, we're going to see more disciplined people react differently. Uh, I mean, I'm in front of a camera now. Um, you're in front of a camera now. Uh, uh, we tend to be more focused. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll tell stories at the beginning of the meeting, the end of the meeting, but we get, I, I sense we get more done mm -hmm. online. So I do think the, the, uh, uh, the, I think the other thing then is the realization that rather than I go down the hall and I say, I need a report and you give me that report and we have that face-to-face -face contact and I believe what you gave me. Mm -hmm. I do think that now that we're remote and, 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 you know, something shows up in my mail and I haven't had that personal interaction and contact, I'm going to question just instinctively, did you send me the right number or not? Yeah. So, so I think that slight shift in, in, in personal contact might have a bit more discipline to it. Then again, you know, I, I pick up the phone, I say, Anthony, I need help. I need a report of this and that. I need all the left-handed board stretchers 
that we sold in Arkansas last year. Can you get me a number? And, and then you call me back and give me the number. That's really not that much different than Zoom or WebEx or anything anyway. So I don't know. I, I mean, um, uh, uh, definitely changes in work patterns and stuff and more reliance on data. Maybe someone will realize if you rely on it even more, you better look over, look over someone's shoulder and make sure they're doing it right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you bring up an interesting point that I think a lot of folks uh, may not in inherently think about it. And that is, in some ways, the remote nature makes certain things more transparent. Like you said, like if I'm watching a screen share very carefully versus sitting across from somebody at their desk and not quite seeing what's on their screen or, or not quite being able to see the details behind it. If I'm seeing that screen share, it gives me an opportunity to do what, exactly what you were saying in, in questioning the method uh, a little bit more clearly than I might be able to in a, in a workplace setting. And I think a lot of times we focus on these negatives of the remote work, but this could really be perceived in, in many ways as a positive. If you can get your data working for you in a more consistent manner, all of those interactions become that much easier as well. Well, you know, um, it, uh, oh, I don't know, back in the, the early twos, I was studying collaboration and workflow really closely because a partner and I were working on kind of a, um, a mashup of knowledge management and BI and workflow. Mm -hmm. And uh, we called it collaborative business intelligence. Now that we actually tried to trademark it and we didn't get it. It's since been trademarked. So that just shows we had a bad lawyer anyway. Um, but, uh, um, we, we, we thought, you know, collaborating with data was really, really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, and there were more powerful ways to do that. Uh, and then when you look at workflow, you know, workflow is I do something and then that document is digitally sent to someone else. And then you get like an email or something, right? You click on the link and you work on the document. Um, so when we're on Zoom or something, that's essentially what we're doing. We are being forced to to collaborate. And and I use the word collaborate with great deliberation. Collaboration is a learned skill. Human beings are not born knowing how to collaborate. We, we know how to cooperate. In the first grade, you were told, don't right. grab Billy's scissors. They're his scissors, right? <laughs> you share the scissors with Billy, right? You were taught that's cooperation. Collaboration is actually a specific way to work with a specific protocol. I have a couple of books on the subject, uh, mm -hmm. uh, looked at it. Um, and, and what I've learned, the biggest thing I've learned is we don't know how to do it, but this environment we're in is actually forcing us into collaborative behaviors. So yeah, we've got some different uh, ways of doing stuff. I, I you know, uh, may you live in interesting times, right? The proverb says. Yes. Yes. So one of the things that you've talked about a lot at conferences um, over the past couple of years, especially, uh, is this notion of data debt. And I think that there's a, there's an equation here that data debt will, if we can solve for that, some of the things that we've been talking about in this conversation will hopefully get easier, um, but it will also enable new new capabilities for our business. Can you talk about what data debt is for those that aren't aware and, and what should we be doing about it? Yeah, I, so I don't know, six, seven years ago, I had a client and they were a, an agile software development shop and they mentioned technology debt was getting too high, even though they were trying really hard to be a good agile shop. Yeah. And if, if the person, if an individual listening to this doesn't know what agile is, it's, it's a way of, it's a very disciplined, rigorous way of developing software quicker. It is not a quicker, cheaper way of doing software. It's actually more disciplined than traditional waterfall things if you really study it anyway. Yeah. So, but you have this thing called tech debt, which means, well, you know, we really want to put this feature in uh, but we've got to deliver these other features. So we, we, we put it in and then we tell our, our customers it's going to be in the next release. Now, Lord knows we've all heard this, right? <laughs> it's in the next release. We've heard it by any data tool. Well, that's the next release, right? So, so, but there's debt and they, and they, and they, they account for that. They say, now we're going to spend a little bit extra 
to fit that into the next release, but it would have been cheaper to put it into the current release, but we ran out of time, right? And the difference between that, the cheaper now and the more later, is debt. You've borrowed against the future. Well, we're back to talking about interest again, aren't we? Here we go. All right. So, so, we're, so that's debt. Now we pay that to data. How many times have you said, all right, we're going to do this project. We need all the customer data. Well, I'll build a database. Well, no, wait, someone else says, well, we have the customer database over here mm -hmm. and it has all the fields in it. We just need to add two columns to the existing customer database. And someone else says, well, we don't have the time to do that because then we'll have to test all the programs that use the old customer data. We don't have time for all that. We don't, can't spend the money, blah, 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 blah. So you do it, you do it quickly. Now you have an extra customer database. And most organizations have done this enough times that they have a lot of extra customer right. <laughs> database to the point where they have no idea how many customers they really have, right? So that's debt. You have incurred an obligation to the future. And, and so I started to, uh, started to use that phrase data debt with this client. Uh, um, uh, and then I started to say, now, how can I use this? It's two, I use it for two ways. One is a communications vehicle. One of the biggest problems we hear from our data constituents is how do I talk to management? How do I talk to leadership? They won't listen to me. I can't get, I can't get buy-in. I don't like that. I like dislike that phrase as much as I dislike <laughs> low hanging fruit. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, and I say, speak to them in their terms. If you want to do this quick and dirty, just calculate the data debt, put them in front of them and say, you're making an you're making an informed decision to incur debt to this organization. Right. You don't have to get their buy-in. They're business people. At that point, they have to trigger their business person gene and and make and make an informed decision. Oh, okay, I borrow money. Uh I didn't think of it. You mean it's gonna cost us six million dollars to fix this? Yeah, I said, well, you said we'll do it now and fix it later, boss. Well, here's what fix it later is. And and they go, oh, wow. Will it really cost six? Ah, six, give or take. What I mean, right? Mm -hmm. So I use it. It's a communications thing to say to people, don't incur data debt. And I've implemented this. I've actually implemented this as formal policy at two organizations. And it has worked. You would not believe how well it works. The, the quality of the data portfolio starts to climb immediately. Mm -hmm. And IT, AppDev, they, are we, this is a podcast, we're allowed to be colorful, aren't we? Yeah. They bitch and moan like a bunch of old women at a card party, all right? And it, you got to slow it down. You know what? I dare any AppDev person on this planet to show me the data that a new standard and using a concept of data debt slows them down. I dare them because I have watched it. I've measured it myself. Data standards, data governance, avoiding data debt does not slow you down. In the long run, it lowers your development costs. In the long run, it, it um, improves your portfolio. And in the short run, it doesn't make you spend much more anyway. Because, you know what? Because I used to be a CIO and I was a VEVP, I was a VP of data management, which would nowadays would be a CDO, right? So I've had these positions and ain't nobody ever done nothing on time on budget anyway. So that, <laughs> that, that is such an empty excuse to me. Um, so data debt is also a measurement. That's the second thing, right? I, that difference, I told you a numerical difference. Why not so you do make a decision to do it quick and dirty. Maybe business is falling apart. Maybe you've got a burning platform. You've got to do something tactical. We all know you got to do that, mm -hmm. but we measure the debt anyway. And we say, well, we did something tactical. Yay, we saved the business. Now, how do we make our business long-term sustainable? We can't keep doing you know, chewing gum and bailing wire technology solutions because right. now we're incurring more debt, more debt, more debt. How do we reduce our debt? And, and using it as a metric, actually, and this is pretty sophisticated, and uh, I do this pro forma for clients because they don't want to make it a formal process yet, and I, and I, I, I get that. Um, but when you do it, you got, you, it's a terrific metric. As you drive the debt down, you start to see real improvements, real improvements in your data portfolio. Oh, yeah. 
So yeah, I mean, it, it's a, it's, and it's a great way to communicate with leadership because you say, look, I know you don't understand this data and data models and metadata. And, all, and you know what? You don't have to. Those are our tools. You know, you know that's right. trying to convince a CEO what a data model is, just that's, don't do that. It's not appropriate. Okay. But we have our tools here and we're here to tell you that if we do it this way now, it's going to cost more later. You make the call. Yeah. We're just going to sit here and measure it for you. And worst case scenario, we sit there and go, nana, 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 look, we were right. Right. But but yeah, and it, it's a, it's it's powerful. It's very. That's one of the reasons I did my second edition of the book. I this I had to talk about data debt a lot. You know. Yeah. Well, that that whole notion of of identifying, measuring, and then ultimately choosing trade offs deliberately, and mm -hmm. you you hit on and and one of the reasons that this data debt concept has always spoken so loudly to me personally is that one of my pet peeves is this. It, for some reason. Data governance seems unusually averse to quantifying what they're doing. And I find that yeah. horribly ironic because we're the ones that should be promoting all of this quantification and being data driven. And yet we're like, well, we're going to save a lot of money with data governance. And a reasonable executive says, how much money? And the data governance people are like, well, we don't know, but it'll be a lot. <laughs> and, and it's like the, that kind of mentality. And, and and then you couple that with this notion of like somehow sitting separate from all of the technology that contains pretty much nothing but data and is really how we manifest data in, throughout our organization and trying to figure that we can do all of our data stuff outside of that world entirely because we don't like working with each other because we talk different languages, like you mentioned with the app dev people and the data yeah. people not getting along. And it's like, guys, let's learn about some of the things you talked about with collaboration. We we, we need to do this. Neither of us can be successful without the other. It, it's... Look, all, you, the paychecks all say the same thing in the upper left-hand corner, don't they? Right. Yeah, you know, and and uh, unless you're outsourced, and then that's a whole other argument. Mm. Uh, but, um, you know, to, to the, the point you're making about data governance, not measuring, you know, there is a, I've, you know, I've been harping on business and the tide rising in the boats and, and picking on CEOs and leadership. Well, you know, give me a, two minutes here. And I'm going to pick on our peers. Yeah. Folks, you need to learn to talk to business people. All right. You need to, and you know, uh, again, this article Tom and I wrote a few weeks ago, go down the hall and meet a stranger and shake their hand. Data people tend to be very introverted <laughs> and I want to do this. Um, uh, but I, I'll be really honest. All right. If you're a data person, and you don't think it's part of your job to extend a hand and wait out there and maybe not be a provocateur like Tom says, but at least get more engaged with people that you don't know, you know, and, you know, uh, not wait for your boss to set up the meeting, but just be friendly and, and out there, then you don't believe in your cause. You don't really believe data should be more disciplined or managed in an organization because you don't have the stones to go down the hall and <laughs> preach your message. If you can't preach your message, you're not a believer. Yeah. You're, you, you're, you are in favor. You like it. You're deeply interested in it, but you're not an evangelist. So, you know, which is fine. Hey, look, if you want to spend your career being a data steward, do it. Be the best you can. If you want to be a data modeler, be the best data model you can be it, but don't come and complain about leadership if you're not making a proactive effort, all right? If you say, well, they're not listening to us. You know what? If I'm a CEO, and I've done this when I, my first, when I became a VP of information management at a healthcare organization, I entered into the middle of them, had bought a, we call it a glossary now. We used to call it a repository, remember, Anthony? <laughs> and it, what was one of the big ones? Platinum or something like that? Was that what it was called? You're, maybe you're not old enough, son. I don't know. I'll, I'll claim to be too young. <laughs> okay. It was it was one of the big dinosaur, you know, a data dictionary products. And they were in the middle of it and, and they were drawing models and trying to grab what we would call metadata now and define. And they're having meetings and feeding middle management over the head, like, what's a customer? What's a customer? What's a customer? 
and, and all this. And I went in there and, you know, and I said, yay, John's here. We know John. He was from our area. He's back here. John's here. Yay, John's here. And I killed that sucker. <laughs> Second week, <laughs> I killed it. And they went, what? I said, because I, you're not doing anything for this company. You're just flushing money down the toilet. Yeah. We've got bigger problems right now. We we have this thing called managed care coming out of nowhere that's going to destroy the industry if we don't figure out how to deal with it and things like that. And, 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 you know, I got 20 people in a department and eight of them are running around building a tool that nobody's going to use. Sorry, bad business, bad, but doesn't care whether it's a wonderful tool, bad business. Oh, you, you, it, may, it reminds me so much of when when I was a chief data officer, you know, I had come out of consulting. I'd spent, you know, several years trying to sell data governance, consulting projects and things like that, become a chief data officer. And I was quoted and, and I stand by this. The last thing on my mind when I became a chief data officer was wanting to buy data governance. Like there's there were so many other things that were more impactful for the business than creating yeah. a big comprehensive program. I needed to be tactical i needed to be strategic but i couldn't do a big program with nebulous goals and and no accountability that that wasn't the kind of thing that would resonate in the circles that i had to to operate in and so you had to find ways to pepper in good practice with, for sure but you you couldn't brand that effort with no teeth the the way no. i think many organizations try to do well yeah i mean the the you know, you want to change people's behavior with data, which means they need to be more data literate. At the end of the day, remember, and this is what page one of my book or something, yeah. data governance goes away. All right. It, it's it's part of the backdrop, like HR. It's part of the backdrop of an organization. It's, it's like wearing right. your badge to work. It's just something you do. It's not special. It's not a separate funded program. You uh, it should be built into overhead. It should never increase overhead. There should never be a data governance department. There should be a data governance capability and function. Now, HR is a department, but but HR has uh, some developments and some operational things nowadays. Um, uh, uh, and sometimes you have auditors, like in finance, so you might have data auditors. So there might be some separate overhead. But just getting people to learn to behave better, that's why the non-invasive approach that Signer talks about is psychologically cool for a lot of companies because you just teach a few people to do better than what, you know, you're doing something, you know, it's kind of like you're hitting a golf ball this way and I'm going to adjust your grip and I'm going to adjust your swing and I'm going to have you hit it 20 yards farther down and everyone's going to go, whoa, dude, your handicap just went down five, five strokes. Mm -hmm. Can I get some of that? I mean, that's how that works. And, and that's, that's to your point. That's what you were saying. You've got to organically just change some behaviors. Yeah. So, and, and, and for anybody who hasn't read John's, you know, book on, on data governance, one of the best books in this space, he's recently come out with a, a second edition. And, and the secret that if you haven't picked up on it from this conversation, you should know data governance isn't really about data so much as it is about organizational change and transformation and, and, yes. and changing people's behavior. And so, John, I'm really curious, what what precipitated the second edition? Like, what has changed to the point where you're like, because you even, you said early on, you're like, your, your original reason for writing that book was was kind of blind rage and needing to get yeah. something said. And I can relate to that because I, I wrote my book out of the same mental state. But yeah. You, you you went through and, and did a pretty comprehensive overhaul of this book. Why, yeah, why, yeah. why now? Why why did that, why were you compelled to do that? Because having done a book, it's not a fun thing. So you got to really want to make that adjustment to get it out again. Uh, especially it was 85% of the book is different. Yeah. And basically it was a rewrite. And, and yeah, and so I took another six months of my life out. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, maybe that's why my bank balance isn't high. Maybe it has nothing to do with my brand. Maybe it's just, I just don't work. Uh, anyway, um, no, the second, here's the thing. Uh, um, I was starting to noodle with it. Publisher said, hey, this sucker's selling really, really good. Do you want to do another book? I said, actually, what we need to do is revisit this. When I first, when that book first came out in 2012, big data was just getting ahead of steam. But honestly, to me, big data was no was just an evolutionary set of words like we talked about words being overused and we we get numb to buzzwords right yeah 
and I'm old. I'm experienced. I'm like, ah, well, it's another damn hula hoop. I, you know, big data, schmig data. I don't, it's, you know, um, and they said, well, but we're going to do predictive this. I said, we called it data mining in the 90s. We called it closing the loop with a sophisticated algorithm. Now it's called machine learning. It was, it's, by the way, algorithms are the same, folks. They haven't changed since the early 60s. It's called operations research. So you had another name way back then. Yeah. All right. Anyway. Um, but so I was like, okay, so, but this, but we have this now wave of the, what really got me was the data monetization part. And companies, you know, Doug Laney came out with the Infonomics book, and it was uh, uh, popular. And CEOs are really starting. And now my my customers are calling me, you know, da 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 da. da. I said, okay, the world's changed. We've got to address that. Okay, we that was not thoroughly addressed in it. Then you know, you get some new ideas as you keep doing this work. You get some new things. You have to address what other people are are doing in it. There was a there was a period where there was. Bob Seiner's book and John's book. And it was the two ways you did it. You did A or B. And it was becoming like Kimball and Inman. We all remember that little yeah. faux religious war, which couldn't be farther from the truth. All right. You know, it's not that way or that way. I mean, some people's approach is a blend of the two. Yeah. Right. So I decided, you know what, in spite of me saying in the book, once a chapter that you need to configure this approach for your plan, I decided to say it every other paragraph and just beat people over the head with it. That that that, that, that what's in here is a is are some essentials, but you it's up to you to tweak it to your culture. The last thing I did, and I'll be done with the book here, is I changed the mindset from a functional model to a capability-based model because organizations have a really hard time when you root around in business processes. All right. Business processes are dynamic. They're always changing. You have a whole discipline around it, like lean and six Sigma, all that kind of, and, and here we come with more functions and processes and policies and, and you know, they're necessary, but you can't make that the starting point. The starting point is what does the organization need to do to get more from its data assets and a, what is a capability, a how is a function or a process. So I backed off and, put in a whole bunch of new material on capability-based approaches because it just works better. It's more palatable. It's more digestible by leadership. And at the end of the day, leadership are the ones that are going to say, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to do today literacy training. I'm going to carry this thing on forward. Um, and also the capabilities allowed me now a path to leadership, which wasn't there before. Because, you know, if you're talking processes and functions, you're talking to the enterprise architect. Nice people do a great job. Every place needs one, not influential. You need to get to, you need to get to the folks that'll change things around. So, so capabilities allow you uh, uh, to do that. So yeah. that's that's that, that's one of the many reasons I redid it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, John, we're just about out of time. Um, do you have any other parting words of wisdom, anything you want to leave our audience with that they should be thinking about after this episode, as they move forward with data, any, any uh, last parting wisdom for you? Well, we, we started out talking about some very broad concepts, you know, anthropological, this and the boats rising in the tide, very, very pedantic intellectual academic stuff. Um, and yeah. But the end of the day is you got to do good for your organization. All right. So just remember that. Remember that there are points of light. This stuff does work. But the expectations leadership has and the way the vendors are selling this stuff is setting the expectations up here at this really high anthropological level. All right. Um, but they're only giving you the tools and the air cover to, at this level. You know, they're selling you to go across the Atlantic and 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 to, and do victory over the Nazis in 1942, right? But they only give you enough gas to get to Newfoundland. All right, it ain't gonna work. Okay, they're so you, you need to balance expectations. If you know the boss says I want a data strategy. 
and we're going to do data governance because I'm tired of kicking this can down the road. And then he looks at you and says, Anthony, it's your job. Dedicate half your time next year and implement this data governance project. You say, no. You just told me to win the war for the allies with one LST and an antique biplane. All right. Can't be done, boss. I have due diligence requires me to tell you no, can't be done. So I guess my, my last, my last phrase here, and I promise I'll quit talking. <laughs> um, if you want to do this stuff and you know, you need help. And if, and by the way, if someone says the, the most common data governance program, now the staffing is one half FTE and all my research. And that's just wrong. I just, that's, that's almost morally wrong <laughs> for, for a CEO or a VP or a CDO to do that to somebody. Okay. Well, there's no CDO doing that. Hopefully a CDO wouldn't do that, but you know, someone says, well, you, here, you've got half, half your job is to do gate of governance. It's just wasting time. So if you're in that situation, you need help. Okay. Um, I see a lot of incorrect use of consultants. All right. So I've been a consultant for pretty much all of my career, but I've also been inside. There is a time to use consultants and a time to not use consultants. There is a time to tighten your belt, suck it in and do it yourself. Okay. Um, and try it and learn. Okay. So you use the consultants when there is you're doing something you're only going to do once or twice in a career, like a enterprise data strategy mm -hmm. that is tied to an explicit, you know, something that the board of directors might see. You might want some outside eyes for that. Um, uh, one thing you don't hire is consultants to actually operate data governance, unless it's just to get the program up and running. Right. Obviously you don't want outsiders doing, it's just like hiring a data steward. Why would you want to do that anyway? Um, what kind of consultants do you use? Well, this is going to sound self-serving, but um, first you use whoever you think is going to do the job and you vet them like you should vet anyone else. And a lot of companies don't vet consultants very well. Hmm. You should also understand that just because your company has used a uh, big five firm XYZ for the last 30 years, it's very doubtful they can do this kind of stuff that you and I do, Anthony, at the level you and I can do it they don't have the experience and they don't have the bench. They, 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 they just do it. That said, they can certainly help you with infrastructural stuff and the big project or the MDM and all those kinds of really, really cool things. Yeah. So my, 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 my word is don't dismiss the boutique or the one person operation. They tend to be actually more effective and you get more for your buck uh, from those. Uh, so those kind of folks um, uh, that's, Next to last piece of advice. The last piece of advice is if you're doing data governance and you don't have a data strategy, you don't have a target. If the boss says, let's do data quality, that's great. But tell them we're only gonna fix the one thing you're targeting at unless you get the boats to raise in the tide altogether. This is just gonna be points of light. Mm -hmm. um, be that provocateur, reach out and start to think like a business person. Yes, we'll do this. Yes, we'll work. We'll stand up this AI model. We'll stand up a data science department. We'll do a data quality project. We'll do a glossary and uh, hopefully get some business benefit from that. But think beyond that. Think beyond that. Think beyond that. Because as if you don't think beyond that, you're going to do a great project. And then you're just going to sit there at lunch one day in the cafeteria going, why aren't they really adapting all this stuff? Well, because you just did a project for them. You didn't, you didn't evangelize or anything. Yeah. That's great advice. I can stop talking now. <laughs> well, John, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been absolutely awesome. We didn't even get to half of the stuff we wanted to get to. So we will hopefully have you back again soon. Do it again. We and... will have John part two. Yeah, I would, I would love to do that. So thank you again, and thank you for watching or listening today. You'll find links and more information about today's topic in the show notes. Please remember to subscribe to our show on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Visit algman.com to learn more about Algman Data Leadership and the many ways we can help you become a data leader. Stay safe during these unusual times and go make an impact. 